thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you again to all of you for being here and participating in these conversations. As I've said before, uh, both up here in informal conversations uh, with several of you, I don't really feel like my role in this event is so much to share with you any great wisdom that I bring, but rather to uh, attempt to stimulate or inspire more conversations among you within your community, among judges and prosecutors and lawyers and other experts about uh, these very important issues that are affecting your country right now. And I hope that in this third and final session in this series, we can continue in that spirit. And as before, I will say a little bit by way of opening remarks to set the stage and maybe raise some questions or issues, and then we will uh, proceed to what I think is the more interesting part of the session, and that's when we have an opportunity as a group to contribute our thoughts, insights, observations, and so forth. The, um, the title I picked for this last uh, session is The Promise and, Promise and Limits of Electoral Democracy as a Check on Corruption, which is, uh, I think, an important topic here and in many democracies, both new and old. Uh, this topic differs a little bit from the ones that we did yesterday and the, yesterday and the day before in that it's not really specific in any way to the role or responsibilities of prosecutors or others who are involved in anti-corruption law enforcement specifically. So two days ago we were talking about issues related to enforcement strategy and tactics and the use of legal mechanisms like settlement. Yesterday we were thinking a little bit more broadly about the political context, but that was very much in the it framed in terms of how those involved in anti-corruption enforcement activities should consider the political ramifications of what they're doing. Uh, the, the question of, of how electoral democracy may be effective in limiting corruption, but also what some of the challenges are associated with that uh, democracy-corruption relationship is not really specific to prosecutors or judges or other enforcers, um, but I thought it would be useful to have some conversation about this both for more general context and in all of our roles as citizens of democracy, these are important issues to think about, but also I think the, this topic relates very much to the conversation we were having yesterday in that it broadens the focus a little bit to think about the uh, broader political context of anti-corruption enforcement in a democratic society. So um, let me start off with uh, some facts or observations uh, that are relevant to the relationship between democracy and corruption and both the promise and potential limitations of electoral democracy as a way to limit corruption. First thing, it's pro probably obvious, but it's worth stating or restating, citizens on the whole don't like corruption. That might seem like kind of an obvious thing to say, but it wasn't that long ago that the extent to which this was true or whether it was true across countries and cultures was a matter of debate. There was a position that many people took that argued that in many parts of the world, especially the so-called developing world or south or what have you, that what in wealthy western northern countries would be considered corruption uh, was considered a normal, indeed, legitimate aspect of, of politics. There, that, that claim existed, but it seems not to be true. There's some variation across countries and cultures about public attitudes towards practices one might consider corrupt, but on the whole, across the world, across cultures, people really don't like corruption. And the amount of variation in what they consider to be improper corrupt behavior is actually not nearly as big as people sometimes suggest. Yes, there are some cultural differences around the edges, but when we talk about what we might think of as the, the black core of corruption, things like bribery or embezzlement, there's widespread agreement that these things are corrupt, that they are wrong, and citizens don't like them. So we might think, given that fact, that politicians or parties who are implicated in corruption scandals would do less well in elections, and there does seem to be some evidence that that's true. On average, politicians or parties who are exposed uh, having engaged in corruption or who are otherwise caught up in some kind of uh, corruption scandal seem to do less well on average in subsequent elections. Um, and it also uh, appears to be the case that politicians who uh, anticipate 
that, uh, who face re-election, who, who are interested in running for election or re-election, and who know their behavior is being monitored, appear to engage in uh, less corrupt activity than others do. Some of the most convincing evidence uh, for these claims actually comes from Brazil, thanks to the random auditing program for municipalities that uh, your country instituted some number of years back. I gather it's had some modifications recently, but long story short, there was at least a period of time where Brazilian municipalities were selected at random for government audits to investigate not just corruption, but also uh, potential misuse of public funds or other accounting irregularities. Economists and other social scientists love Brazil for doing this because it's random. The random assignment of which municipalities got audited and which ones didn't uh, is helpful in figuring out what the effect of the audit was. The other nice feature of the Brazilian system is the two-term limit on municipal mayors, which meant in some of the places that were being audited, the mayor faced re-election incentives and the other ones the mayor did not. And the findings seem fairly clear that in those, uh, in those municipalities where a mayor was eligible to run for re-election, if the audit exposed irregularities, especially those suggestive of corruption, the probability of the mayor being re-elected did drop. Uh, and this was more pronounced when there was more better media access in those districts. And this effect was uh, less significant for second term mayors who didn't face re-election incentives. There's also some evidence, again, related to the relationship bet between democracy and corruption, but also related to the importance of separation of powers, again, coming from Brazil in these audits, that having the political opposition control more seats on the local council that uh, appears to be associated with uh, less or fewer irregularities discovered by the audit. So basically what the researchers do is they look at uh, close elections, and they find that in those cases where the opposition did at least somewhat better, got one more seat, subsequently the audits found fewer irregularities. So it might be a good thing um, for uh, mayors, for elected mayors, to know that the opposition parties are watching them and can authorize investigations and might be able to disclose information. So that's, that's all really good uh, if you're enthusiastic about the prospects of electoral democracy to reduce corruption. And it also does seem to be the case that if you look across the world comparing countries and you uh, look at the correlation between their scores on these various democracy indexes and their scores on these corruption perceptions indexes and you control for a number of other factors like per capita gross domestic product and uh, a number of other potential confounding variables, there does seem to be a negative correlation between the strength of democracy and the extent of perceived corruption. So that's, that's all good if you, if you think that democracy, electoral democracy is really important to helping keep corruption under control. But uh, there are some uh, issues or concerns here that mean the picture is maybe not, not quite as clear as what I just said might make it appear. So first of all, although there is evidence that uh, being implicated in a corruption scandal on average reduces a politician's subsequent vote share and reduces at least somewhat the probability the politician will be reelected, that's a difference on average. There's a great deal of variation and it turns out that in many countries the overwhelming majority of politicians who are accused of corruption or implicated in a corruption scandal get reelected. So, so again, it's a mixed message here. It's not the case that corruption doesn't matter at all. On average, it does seem to matter, but it doesn't seem to matter nearly as much as people might hope or expect if it's really true, as citizens tell us over and over in these surveys, that they hate corruption, right? Voters will tell you over and over in surveys if you ask the question hypothetically, would you be willing to vote against a candidate, even a candidate that you thought was, was good in other ways, ideologically or in effectiveness, or if, in terms of effectiveness, if that politician uh, was found to be corrupt. And in the hypothetical surveys, voters will say, by often very large majorities, no, I wouldn't vote for a corrupt politician. But then when you look at actual behavioral evidence from elections, politicians credibly accused of corruption often get reelected and get reelected over and over again. Now, not always, right? Sometimes they're forced to retire. Sometimes they really are driven out of office by corruption scandals. But the on average electoral impact of being caught in corruption um, is a little bit misleading because a lot of politicians seem to be invulnerable 
uh, at least in the short to medium term, uh, a, a politically invulnerable to corruption accusations, even quite credible ones. The other is when you do look at this evidence across countries, you look at those correlations between democracy and corruption, there is a relationship, but it turns out to be weaker than many people expected. It's not like a straight line you know, when, you, when you plot these things on a graph. There's a, there's a lot of noise and variation, and in fact, when you look more closely at the data and you refine the statistical analysis, it appears that that result, the, the strong negative correlation between democracy and corruption, is driven almost entirely by countries that have been very democratic for a very long time. That is, if you draw the graph, if you can imagine the graph I'm drawing, the, the corruption in, or the democracy integrity relationship doesn't look like that. It's not like as democracy improves, integrity improves kind of steadily. It looks more like this, right? It's, it, it seems like countries that score at the very high end of these democracy scales, that get like a, a nine or 10 out of 10, or, or those countries that have, have been democratic for 20, 30, or 40 years, and those, that's basically the same set of countries, really do have substantially better scores on things like the Transparency International Corruption Perceptions Index than other countries. But if you lop off that very high end, it actually doesn't seem to be the case that on average, new democracies or partial democracies or incomplete democracies have notably different corruption perceptions index scores on average than autocracies. Now, one lesson one might draw from this, a kind of maybe encouraging lesson for a place like Brazil, is maybe it, it's a, the lesson is patience. Maybe the lesson is it really is true that electoral democracy, liberal democracy, really will reduce corruption, but it takes time for the institutions to become more entrenched, uh, for uh, political competition to, to start to manifest itself in a more healthy way, for, for citizens to really understand their role and responsibility in democracies and so forth. So uh, if that's right, then you might say, well, you know, Brazil's been in democracy for about 30 years, so the data says somewhere between 20 and 40 years things start to get better, so wait another 10 years or so and things will look good. Um, but there's, a, there's another way to interpret what's going on here, which is that there's just something different about the historical experience of what we sometimes call first wave democracies that had already become democracies by the middle part of the 20th century and that the so-called second or third wave democracies are different in some fundamental respect that we don't understand. So those are some um, basic facts that complicate the narrative of democracy as a, as a cleansing force in the political system, right? We know citizens don't like corruption. When given the opportunity, they, they do seem to take corruption into account when casting their ballots, but not nearly as much as people might expect. And on average, the, the evidence that um, newer democracies do much better on corruption perceptions than autocratic states is, is not terribly strong. Um, why might that be? Why might it be that electoral democracy is not as effective in reducing corruption as many people hope or expect? One issue has to do with voter knowledge and information. If voters don't know about corruption or don't understand what's going on. It's, very, it's much more difficult for them to hold politicians accountable. And in support of this hypothesis, there is evidence that where media penetration is greater and where voter literacy is higher, corruption allegations, corruption scandals, have a more negative effect on politicians' electoral success than otherwise. So that suggests that maybe if you want uh, democracy to help reduce corruption more effectively, we need to really work on making sure voters are well informed. It's a little bit more complicated, though, in part because there's some evidence that when you tell voters about how bad corruption is, the result might not be to get them to to vote out the corrupt politicians at a higher rate, sometimes the result is to make voters even more cynical and disillusioned with the political process and to withdraw altogether. So, so repeating to voters over and over, corruption is widespread, politicians are corrupt, they're engaging in all sorts of corrupt activity, it's kind of a double-edged sword, as the English language expression would have it. It, it may increase voters' uh, willingness to take that into account when making their voting decisions, but it might also increase disillusionment or cynicism and cause some people to withdraw from the political process altogether. Another reason, uh, a quite straightforward reason, why uh, allegations of corruption don't necessarily cause voters to vote the corrupt politicians out of office is that voters care about other issues, as they should. Right, corruption is a really important issue, but there are a lot of other really important issues as well. Um, 
And sometimes voters are put to a choice that's a kind of lesser of two evils choice. Voters care about corruption, but they also care about policy. They care about competence. They care about ideology. Somewhat um, less, uh, uh, somewhat less uh, attractive uh, feature of all this is that voters care about identity. And there's some research that voters will, will vote for the person from their caste or nationality or locality or ethnic group or so forth at a much higher rate, even if that person has a reputation for corruption. Uh, and that fact that voters care about other things, not just corruption, connects to another really important reason why democracy doesn't necessarily have the corruption-reducing force that we might expect, and that's that many voters feel like they just don't have good options, that all of the options are equally corrupt or equally bad. Right. It's not the case that voters can simply go into the voting booth and pick their, their favorite ideal legislator or president or wh whoever. There is a set of candidates on the ballot, a set of parties, a set of candidates they have to choose from among them. And in many systems, voters believe, maybe with some justification, that uh, none of the options are great. And maybe even on the dimension of corruption, many, many voters believe, maybe accurately, maybe just cynically, that they're all corrupt. And so corruption doesn't really affect their voting decision because they feel like anyone uh, I vote for is going to be a thief, so it might as well be my thief, right? So that's a real problem. Now, um, there's another issue here, and this might relate to the, the fact or the observation I noted a moment ago that new democracies or partial democracies don't seem to do that much better on the, on the corruption indexes than autocracies. And that's that although democratization may create a lot of opportunities for reducing corruption, it may also give rise to new forms of corruption, especially those related to competing in and winning elections, a theme that's already been discussed at this conference earlier and I know is a, a big topic of discussion here and elsewhere. So it's very expensive to run an electoral campaign in a modern democracy, in a new democracy. Very often in these systems, the, the rules are kind of loose. Uh, there's a lot of wealth sloshing around, a lot of uh, new businesses, a lot of not, a very, not very good regulation, not very effective uh, enforcement authorities, and the stakes are really high in terms of who wins public office. And so the temptation to cheat may be very strong. It may even be the case that the people who don't cheat have very little chance of winning. And so as I said in my opening lecture a few days ago, you may get the selection process where the people who are successful in, in taking power in these new democracies are the ones who, are most, who have the best access to illicit financing sources and are most willing to exploit them. Or in addition to promise to engage in corrupt behavior to help private sector entities once elected. And again, especially at the moment of a transition to new democracy, it may be that the people connected with the old elites are the ones who are best positioned to win the elections in the new democracies. So um, those uh, factors mean that although I think people are right to look to democracy with some hope and feel like because citizens dislike corruption, uh, democracy creates the opportunity at least to hold elite political actors accountable for their wrongdoing, the picture is much more complicated uh, by these other factors. I want to make sure we have at least a, 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 a plenty of time for our conversation, but I do want to put on the table a, a few other specific considerations that have emerged from the research literature on the corruption democracy relationship that might be relevant to what I hope will be at least an interesting preliminary discussion in our group about how these issues might pertain to Brazil specifically. The first is that Different political systems uh, create parties or political actors that have different degrees of stability or longevity. In some systems, you've got a couple, maybe a few major parties that are organized around ideologies or programs, and they stick around. Right? And leaders come, leaders go, the parties stay, voters have a pretty good idea of what the parties stand for, and they'll alternate in power to some degree. On the other hand, you sometimes have systems where there really is only one dominant party that everyone expects to keep winning elections for the foreseeable future. No one really, maybe there will be a new generation of leadership, maybe there will be new turnover, but that party really has a, a lock on control of the government even if the country is nominally democratic. So Japan for decades after the end of World War II was like this. Mexico for most of the 20th century was like this. 
And then you have some systems, especially in very new democracies, where the party system is very unstable and governments change all the time. Coalitions form, coalitions collapse, new parties emerge, often around a charismatic leader. When that leader exits the scene, the party disappears, and there's all sorts of instability and cycling. These differences may affect possibly the amount of corruption in a democratic system, but also the type of corruption that takes place in a democratic system. In systems where governments tend to not last very long, parties are very unstable, they emerge and disappear, the, the incentives that that may create for people who are in power is basically steal as much as I can while I can. Uh, because once I'm out of power, I'm very likely to, to be in power. Again, I don't really care that much about the future. I don't have a very long, what we would call in English, a long time horizon. Uh, and so it's really about short-term grabbing, short-term looting. Uh, that creates incentives for particular types of corruption. Other kinds of corruption are actually less likely to emerge in this sort of situation because, uh, let's say, business conglomerates or foreign interests are less likely to try to form long-term collusive deals with the party and government at any particular moment if they're going to disappear uh, in a few years and then they'll have to negotiate with someone else. On the other hand, in these systems where you have very stable one party or one leader systems where everyone's pretty sure that the guy who's in power now is going to be in power 15 years ago, you might see less short-term looting, especially if that has a destructive effect on the economy. But it's easier for these leaders to form uh, long-term collusive relationships with business interests that will last a very long time. So you might see less kind of ostentatious theft, but more um, improper blending of business and government interests in these relational contracts, formal or understood, that last for years or decades. You, the happy medium might be stable parties that alternate in and out of power. And the alternation means you can't necessarily form a corrupt deal with the people in power today because they might be gone tomorrow. But on the other hand, the parties know they're going to come, they're going to go, uh, but they might come back again. So they don't just have the incentives to feel like, hey, the party's about to end. Let's do everything we can now. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind when you think about a democratic system, a system like Brazil's. What's the, what's the stability of the relevant political actors? Are they uh, stable enough, uh, not stable enough, too stable in the sense of around for too long, that's one issue. Uh, second issue, and the, the, the uh, chapter that I included in the readings, which I hope by now everyone has done, uh, discusses this at, at greater length, but political scientists have studied different electoral systems with respect to the incentives they create for what are sometimes called party-centric elections versus candidate-centric elections. What does that mean? That means when voters go to vote in the election, for the legislature, for the presidency, whatever, are the voters focused more on uh, which party do I want to vote for and maybe don't care so much about the particular individual candidate? Or are voters more focused on which individual candidate, which person do I like, and maybe care less about the party? Some systems, like so-called open list proportional representation systems, where voters uh, vote for a party, but they also vote for an individual candidate within that party. Uh, and voters tend to vote for, and in any given district tends to vote for many uh, seats, seats in the legislature all at once. These, on average, tend to produce very party-centric elections. Because often, excuse me, very candidate-centric elections. I misspoke, very candidate-centric elections. Because the voter may know, I want to vote for the Christian Democrats, say, in Italy. But they're like eight. 10, 12, 15 people running as Christian Democrats, I need to figure out which one of them I want to vote for. So those individual candidates have less of an issue to push the party brand and more of an issue to push their own personal brand. In closed list proportional representation systems where voters just vote for a party and the individuals who get seats in the legislature is just based on the party list determined by the party leaders, they're the, the, and no individual candidate has an incentive to say vote for me personally, it's all about the party and the party brand. Plurality systems, where each district elects one person, are kind of in the middle because each candidate is representing one party. Does that difference, candidate-centric elections versus uh, party-centric elections, make a difference in the overall level of corruption? The evidence seems to be probably not. The political scientists who have seen whether corruption seems to be different on average between open list proportional systems, closed list proportional systems, plurality systems, find results going one way, the other way, nothing. The more interesting question is whether the type of corruption you would see in a party-centric system 
or a, a candidate-centric system would be different. And that might, might be important in a democracy when you need to figure out what's, what are the greatest corruption risks, what should you be most worried about. In a system that's candidate-centric, there's, I think there are stronger disincentives to engage in sort of personal venal corruption because if voters find out about it, even if voters like your party, they could just vote for a different person from your party, right? So the, 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 uh, this, the situation where voters are trapped because they feel like ideologically, I want to vote for the conservative party, but the conservative guy is corrupt, occur, doesn't occur as much. If there are 12 conservative candidates the voters could vote for, and they could just shift their vote from the corrupt one to the non-corrupt one. On the other hand, in candidate-centric systems, the incentive to cultivate a so-called personal vote or to maybe cheat to win are stronger because the candidates are competing not just against parties that are ideologically different, they're competing against people who are ideologically similar. So they need to cultivate the support of voters for reasons that are very personal. And that might take the form of doing good things, but it could also take the form of doing bad things. Um, it's also the case that with candidate-centric systems, excuse me, with party-centric systems, uh, a good thing about that is the party might have an incentive to want to protect the party's brand. And so the party leaders may use their power, let's say over a position on a closed list, to discipline or punish people in the party who give the party a bad name. Uh, that could be good. That suggests that in some circumstances where the party leaders have decided that the best way to compete is to promote a, a party reputation for integrity, these systems that give party leaders more control and have more party-centered rather than candidate-centered elections would be good for fighting corruption. However, a number of people have researched countries, especially in um, Latin America, though I think the research was not about Brazil in particular, that have showed in some places the party systems be some, become so corrupt that party leaders use their power over something like the party list and the power to reward individuals with better seats on the party list if they do the party's bidding. This actually helps parties run these corrupt structures. So again, this is why there might not be a clear answer to whether these systems are better or worse overall from the perspective of corruption, but the kind of corruption they create may be quite different. Uh, another issue I want to mention here that may be especially salient in Brazil, although I don't know enough about the Brazilian political system to have a specific comment, is that electoral systems <clears throat> and party systems differ <clears throat> in the degree of political and legislative fragmentation they create. That is, how many parties are out there that are viable. In a country like mine, that has for the most part single member districts and a plurality voting rule, uh, these systems have a tendency to create two big parties. Not always, every once in a while we'll have a small third party that will emerge maybe at the state level. Every once in a while someone from a third party will win a legislative seat. But for the most part, a system like the US system creates a couple of very big parties. Other systems create a much larger number of viable parties competing in the election and winning seats in the legislature, which means ultimately to form a legislative majority you've got to put together a coalition. Again, something like a plurality system tends to produce less party fragmentation. Something like a proportional representation system tends to produce more. And an open list proportional representation may produce even more if you count factions within a party as almost like separate parties. You may get more factions within the party if you have an open list system than a closed list system, precisely because in a closed list system the party leadership can take control and say, no, no, this is going to be the dominant view. So how might these, these, this difference matter for corruption? Again, it's not clear that one or the other is better on average for corruption, but the kinds of corruption risks they create may be different. So one advantage of systems that make it easy for new candidates or parties to enter, something like an openless proportional representation system that creates opportunities for many parties or many factions to have a plausible opportunity to win seats in the legislature, is that it helps redress this problem that I noted before, that voters may feel trapped. A, a conservative voter may feel like, hey, I'm conservative, I would like to vote for a non-corrupt conservative party or candidate, but gosh, I only have the liberal party and the conservative party, and if the conservative party is re reputed to be corrupt, what am I gonna do? In a system where you could have six conservative parties, then if the establishment conservative party is perceived as corrupt, then people can form a new party. Or you could get a new faction within the conservative party that says, we're the reformers. And in an open list system, the voter could say, okay, I'm gonna shift my vote to that one. So that would suggest the system 
I was about to say like the Brazilian system, but I want to be careful because I do not know enough about Brazil. But a system that, similar to the Brazilian system, produces lots of parties and makes it easy for new parties to enter has an advantage when it comes to reducing corruption. But systems that produce these high levels of fragmentation also have a couple of very important disadvantages. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it may weaken the monitoring of parties and candidates by other parties and candidates. So in my country where there are two major parties, the Democrats and the Republicans, they're always scrutinizing each other and any evidence of wrongdoing by the other one is gonna be publicized. The Democrats have an incentive to expose any corruption engaged in by Republican politicians. The Republicans have a very strong incentive to expose corruption by Democratic politicians. This can sometimes be destructive, but on the whole can be helpful because political parties are often very well positioned to monitor and expose corrupt behavior in the political process. When you have 15, 20, 30 parties that are relatively small that may need to form coalitions with each other, the incentive of any one party to attack another party may go down. It may go down for a couple of reasons. First, the benefit of attacking the governing party is less if the loss of government support would be dispersed over a larger number of opposition parties. In the United States, Democrats know that a reduction in re Republican support will lead to an increase in Democratic support by an approximately equal amount. If there were 12 opposition parties in one government party, reducing the government support by some amount might lead to the increase in opposition support be spread out over those parties. So that means the benefit of exposing wrongdoing by another party is lower. And it also means if coalitions are constantly forming and reforming, gosh, do you really want to antagonize a potential future coalition partner by saying, you're corrupt, I'm going to expose your leaders as uh, embezzlers and criminals and get them sent to jail. That might hurt your chances in the future of forming a coalition. In addition to that problem, another problem that can occur when you get very high degrees of legislative fragmentation is it may just be very different for the prime minister in the case of a parliamentary system or the president in the case of a presidential system to get together a large enough majority to actually do anything legislatively. Uh, and so they need to cobble together a coalition by making particular deals with particular factions. And that might be done through legal means, but the temptation to do this through illegal means Right? by actually either paying them off or looking the other way when they engage in corrupt behavior are very high because if you don't keep that whole coalition together, you might not be able to achieve your political goals. So again, there's this trade-off. The kinds of corruption or the reasons you'll see corruption like are likely different, and there's no easy right answer. If you have a system that creates many, many parties, you might not get very good monitoring. Uh, you might get a reluctance of parties to monitor each other, and you might get people cutting corrupt deals to create a coalition. But if you create a system that really leads to the centralization of political competition in only a handful of major parties, then if both of them end up being susceptible to corruption, or even one of them ends up being susceptible to corruption, voters may find themselves unable to use the tool of elections to select people out because they don't have enough choices. And it's too hard for new politicians, new political movements to enter into the political system. So I've talked for maybe a little bit longer than I wanted. I want to make sure we leave at least half an hour for people to, to share their thoughts about what the implications of this discussion might be for uh, Brazil. But I just want to, to conclude by highlighting uh, a couple of bigger issues that I think are worth putting on the table, if only briefly, when we're having a conversation about democracy and corruption. One is the concern that corruption threatens to undermine the confidence, citizen confidence in liberal democracy as a system, which I want to distinguish from corruption undermining the confidence in any individual political leader or party. Corruption should undermine the confidence of voters in individual leaders or parties. We kind of hope that it would. If it didn't, then we're in the situation where voters don't seem to care about corruption. But when corruption becomes systemic, when voters really start to believe that all or most politicians are, cor are corrupt, or they feel like the existing system is not doing enough to address this corruption, voters might start to lose their confidence in liberal democracy as a system and find themselves more attracted to uh, authoritarian solutions, for example. In extreme circumstances, this problem can create the pretext for military intervention. So in Thailand five years ago, the, I think it was about approximately, uh, the coup that unseated the incumbent uh, prime minister and 
suspended democracy, and it's still uh, suspended, the justification for the coup was corruption, was that the parties were so corrupt the military had to step in to, to fix the system. So I think that's a concern that all of us should have, the, the concern that syst systemic corruption could undermine faith in liberal democracy. So we really do hope that liberal democracy does have this corruption-reducing effect because if it doesn't, because voters are so frustrated with corruption, we might worry that they'll lose confidence in those institutions altogether. The second big picture issue I want to put on the table, obviously uh, foreshadowed by a couple of the blog posts, including the reading, is the risk that precisely because voters in democracies can become very frustrated with corruption and get frustrated with the established parties or institutions to address the problem uh, effectively, Demagogic politicians can exploit those frustrations and exploit that anger in a democratic system uh, to fuel a ri their rise to power. And those politicians very often don't have much use for institutions generally or checks and balances in particular. So while we ought to celebrate and promote democracy and elections and the will of the people as a way to reduce corruption, there is a risk that if the problem's not addressed in an appropriate and effective way that's perceived as appropriate and effective, uh, certain political actors could exploit that frustration to say, I'm a, I'm a tough guy, I'm a disruptive figure, I can cut through all this nonsense and remake politics, and in the process potentially make things much worse by undermining the checks and balances that are really what distinguish liberal democracies characterized from the rule of law by uh, populist democracies or populist authoritarian regimes. And I think that's something we should all be concerned about. Uh, but now, that's again a, a general overview of the issue, but what I want to do now in our remaining half hour, as we've done in these previous sessions, is to hear from all of you with your thoughts about maybe particularly in the Brazilian context how we should think about the role of electoral democracy, both its promise in limiting corruption the challenges associated with democratic institutions as limits on corruption, and what, if anything, Brazil ought to do in the context of current debates over political or other for sorts of reforms. And now I will proceed down there. And I'd like to start speak. here, Professor. Oh, get ready. <laughs> yeah, um, do you know why a dog is, the, is a man's best friend? Do you have a clue I, about it? I feel like this is a trick question. I, actually, as a matter of the history of the evolution of, of man-dog relations, I do know the answer to the question, but I feel like it would be pedantic to give it and would undermine your joke, so I'll just go for it. It's a simple question. The dog doesn't know money. That's why he's a man's best friend. And money isn't the root of uh, those problems. Finance, uh, the, uh, the money to, to run an election, and here in Brazil, uh, uh, We've been trying to change the, the rules of uh, how to finance uh, an election. The politicians can finance their um, election. And right now, companies cannot contribute uh, to finance uh, elections. And I would like to, to hear about you, uh, what do you think about this particular um, problem? Yeah, it's, it's a nice question. Um, I'm not really sure what dogs have to do with it, but that's, that's uh, I mean, <laughs> Rats don't know about money either, but like, you don't have to see how many people hang it out with rats. But that, that's not the point. The point is a really good point, which is how do we think, and so I didn't really talk about this specifically, but it's, it's absolutely vital, I should have talked about it. Yeah, the system for financing these extremely expensive elections legally has enormous implications for uh, corruption in a number of ways. Uh, and it's a really challenging problem, the answer to which I don't, I don't really know, uh, but I can at least frame why I think it's such a challenging question. And, and as with a lot of these other things we're talking about, it's challenging because you can make errors in both directions. So you could have a system where candidates can legally raise unlimited amounts of money from individuals and corporate actors uh, without any real system of regulation. You could do that. Um, the United States doesn't have that system, but, but boy, it, it's pretty close. It's very easy in the United States to legally uh, raise lots of money and legal for outside groups to spend lots of money on elections, where as long as they don't coordinate their activity with the candidate, uh, they can spend, for all intents and purposes, unlimited amounts. Uh, 
that many people in the United States say is a recipe for what people sometimes call legalized corruption. Now, I don't want to get into boring definitional debates about, well, does it count as corruption if it's actually legal, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, the reason they call it legalized corruption is because there's this very plausible worry that politicians will be overly responsive to those who support their campaigns financially, even if they're doing it through legal channels. So, you know, people don't have to bribe politicians directly. Uh, they can just pour tons of money into supporting the campaigns of politicians whom they like, and those politicians are likely to be even more responsive in the future to the people who are paying for the elections. Now, one might see this and say, well, the, the right thing to do then is to severely limit the amount that private parties, including not only very wealthy individuals, but corporate actors, can spend to help elect particular candidates. And I'm certainly sympathetic to having more stringent restrictions on that sort of political spending that are currently uh, in place in the United States. But there's a, there's a chance of going too far in that direction. If the regulations are so stringent that it's not feasible or it's perceived as not feasible to run an effective campaign relying only on legal sources of funding, then people are going to turn to illegal sources of funding, or at least the temptations to do so are going to be very strong. Uh, it's also the case that even though people giving a lot of money to campaigns seems very distasteful, people are going to want to try to influence government, and if they feel like there's no legal way to do it, they're going to try to find illegal ways to do it. Now, if enforcement were perfect and effective, maybe you would say, well, look, doesn't matter, it just means campaigns will be cheaper, right? If it's very difficult to buy lots and lots of TV ads if you only raise money legally and you enforce the system effectively, then that would just mean we don't have lots and lots of TV ads, which might be a good thing. I don't know what they're like here, but I hate political TV ads. They're just, even for candidates I like, they're just awful. Um, but if you're in the real world and you know enforcement is going to be perfect, you might reasonably conclude that we don't want to make the a system so stringent that as a practical matter, if you play by the rules, you're going to be at a disadvantage because other people are not going to be playing by the rules and they're not going to be getting caught. Um, maybe you want to make things a little bit more liberal in the sense of, of, of forgiving. And again, I, I would love to hear what other members of the audience think about the right way for Brazil to address this issue or, or for any other country to address this issue for that matter, but I agree. I think uh, what every democracy has to grapple with on this front is how do we create the right sorts of channels so that uh, elections can be financed and, and, and political advocacy can be financed in ways that uh, on the one hand don't end up just collapsing into legalized corruption but on the other hand aren't so stringent, so unrealistic that it means that illegal corruption is, uh, becomes the norm, whether it, you know, what, whatever the official rules are. Um, but, but now let's, uh, let's turn things over to, now I'm gonna do the, the fun part where I get to walk down here. We've got about half an hour to talk, which is not nearly enough time to talk about all these issues, but uh, I will uh, throw it open to you all uh, to, to offer some thoughts. And again, I'm, I'd be especially interested, I'm not, as, as probably painfully obvious by it now, I am not an expert in Brazil and Brazilian politics, so I can only speak at a very general level, but I would really like to know what people think about this issue, this issue in the Brazilian context. What are the, what are the important issues here and how should they be addressed with respect to this relationship? Ah, great. I'd like to know, um, how should we see the role of bureaucracy to, uh, to bar politicians from favoring specific suppliers for the government? Because it, it very often, uh, the same company that uh, pours money on the campaign is the one that will be favored afterwards with public contracts. And we have a, a very detailed bureaucracy, so it's a, a very uh, time-demanding process to select the supplier. And even though we, we, we have those um, rates of corruption uh, skyrocketing, so what, how, how should, should we see bureaucracy on this context? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't wanna talk, I'm happy to answer questions, but I don't wanna talk too much because I really do wanna hear what other people have to say about this. I think 
The more general issue your question implicates has to do with what kinds of decisions should be made by electorally accountable agents and what kinds of decisions should be made by agents who are insulated from electoral accountability. And your specific example suggests that certain kinds of decisions related to, let's say, government procurement ought to be made by agents who are not themselves directly involved in the electoral process, at least in situations where we worry about political corruption in that context, for the quite plausible reason that politicians can't promise to trade contracts for contributions if they don't have any control over the contracts, right? If you feel like, hey, if I want to make sure my firm gets lots of highway contracts, the way to do it is to pay off a politician or promise a lot of illegal campaign support to that politician and then in return in office that person will make sure that the contracts go my way. If legally, the politician, le legally and in practice, the politician is incapable of steering contracts towards that firm, then the person who owns the firm might think, well, it's not worth it for me to try to bribe the politician this way because they can't offer me anything in return. So, so that's, that's got to be right. And not just in the contracting area, there's also evidence that in a number of social welfare programs, for example, in those settings where elected politicians like the mayor have the ability to influence the allocation of uh, resources, that you see more corruption in those programs than where resources are simply allocated according to a formula that politicians don't have an opportunity to influence. So uh, to a point, that's got to be an important part of the solution. But it can't be the entire solution because there are certain decisions that really ought to be made by democratically accountable actors. Right? If, you took that, if you took the principle that you just articulated, which makes total sense in that context, to its absurd extreme, it would say we shouldn't have elected politicians at all, we should just let the bureaucracy decide everything. Right? And that's, that, you know, that is a system, right? That you could, you could have, there are countries that, that find that kind of system appealing, right? Uh, but most people who are committed to liberal democracy believe it's a good system because there are certain kinds of decisions for which politicians ought to be responsible. Which means you're never gonna be able to squeeze this problem out of the system entirely, even with those sorts of safeguards, because there will still be people who will be interested in using illegal means to influence those decisions over which politicians ought to have control. The other reason it's not a complete answer is, of course, that there is the risk of corruption in the bureaucracy itself. If you posit an honest bureaucracy and dishonest politicians, it will always look better to shift more control from the dishonest politicians to the honest bureaucracy. But what if you have a situation where the bureaucracy is famous for being a, a hotbed of corruption, that it's just institutionalized, that generations of civil servants are known for just feathering their own nests, to use the English language example, and you have some crusading politician who says, I'm gonna clean up the system, right? Now, it's a little bit different from your example, because your example had to do with the allocation of individual contracts, but you could, I, I hope it's clear why under some circumstances we might say, well, actually we want to empower politicians to have more influence over the bureaucracy precisely to clean it up. So I, I don't disagree with anything you said, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's a complete answer to this basic challenge. Others? Oh, yeah. So, um, if I understood what you said right, and I just want to bring an insight to us, because I see a connection between what you said about procurement and bureaucracy, and also the fact that Brazil has um, a, a party system that allows a lot of coalitions and po political parties, and also the fact um, that, so I'm, I'm going to start saying that what happens in Brazil from my perspective is, for example, Lava Jato uh, car wash operation discovered a lot of schemes uh, in public health companies, in most part due to procurement uh, frauds related to the necessity to have a lot of money to finance campaigns. So, the fact that we actually have uh, large numbers of political parties incentivates a long-term corruption when at the first, in the first moment from your perspective, 
I understood that sometimes various parties would actually make it harder to perpetuate corruption because um, there would the political the person would think I would rather still in the short term because otherwise I won't be here. And what we've seen is that for corruption in some public health entities are perpetuating exactly because the political electoral system demands them to finance uh, the campaigns with the money they get from pr public procurement. So it's just a connection between these three points. Um, in the back. Uh, bom dia a todos. Vou fazer a pergunta em português. Uh, em tempos de desesperança, eu gostaria de compartilhar com todos um exemplo de, de esperança, pelo menos isso foi na minha vida profissional. É, em 2006, é, foi deflagrada a Operação Sanguessuga. Acho que muitos aqui já devem ter ouvido falar sobre ela. É, ela começou no estado de Mato Grosso e, na época, eu era o juiz desse processo, é, envolvendo corrupção também de políticos, é, basicamente na compra de é, ambulâncias por dezenas e dezenas de municípios no Brasil inteiro. Isso deu causa a uma CPMI, que é uma comissão parlamentar mista de inquérito no Congresso Nacional, que terminou apontando o envolvimento de 71 parlamentares nesse processo todo de corrupção. Voltando no tempo, a operação ela foi deflagrada no mês de maio de 2006, 2006 era um ano de eleições, em outubro nós teríamos eleições. E eu, como o juiz responsável pelo processo, muito preocupado com as eleições em outubro e com tantos políticos envolvidos, tinha a pretensão de, de dar alguma resposta à sociedade até a data das eleições. Evidentemente que isso não era possível, o processo penal é muito mais lento do que nós gostaríamos que fosse, mas, independentemente do ritmo do processo penal, dessa operação, ela permaneceu na imprensa pelo menos por seis meses, chegando até o dia das eleições, praticamente todos os dias, com algum tipo de informação na imprensa. E qual que foi o resultado no processo eleitoral? Isso, então, como assim um elemento de esperança na democracia de que ela também pode higienizar uh, o nosso processo eleitoral. Dos 71 políticos que foram apontados nesse relatório elaborado pelo próprio Congresso Nacional, 55 deles não se reelegeram. Ou não se reelegeram porque simplesmente desistiram de postular uma reeleição e, dentre aqueles que insistiram na busca da reeleição, não foram eleitos. Então, isso, não sei se em algum momento chegou ao conhecimento público, foi analisado com maior profundidade. Mas, assim, eu que tinha o processo nas mãos, tinha o relatório da CPMI, tinha o nome das pessoas e acompanhava de perto todo o processo, me pareceu, assim, sabe, um processo silencioso mas tão exitoso da própria sociedade brasileira promover uh, um processo de higienização uh, durante as eleições. Yeah, I mean that if I understood correctly uh, the particular incident you were describing, it relates to what I said in my opening remarks that we do have evidence that when politicians are implicated in corruption scandals, there are examples where it hurts their uh, re-election chances. Definitely, that, that was not an example with which I was familiar, but it seems to fit a number of other cases where politicians were named in significant corruption scandals or other, uh, un other sorts of unethical activity uh, lose votes or often lose seats. So an example from the United States, which is not exactly well, it depends on how you define it. It's not usually, it's not traditional corruption like um, bribery, but there was a, a scandal in 1992 with uh, members of Congress writing bad checks 
uh, from the, ha the House Bank, the House of Representatives Bank, which covered their, their overdrafts. And there were publications of lists of which members of Congress uh, had abused this process the most. And there's some evidence that a number of them either retired to avoid standing for election again when they were tainted, or lost, or at least lost vote share. Uh, but on the other hand, a lot of them were reelected, despite the fact they were implicated in the scandal. So this is why it's a little bit of a complicated issue. Um, but it doesn't always happen. The other thing that your um, intervention, I think, raises, that I'll just I'll mention, because it connects our conversation today with maybe our conversation from yesterday, the idea that disclosures about an ongoing corruption investigation that is not yet complete around an election, which influenced the results of the election, I think ought to make us at least a little bit nervous. So you describe this incident as basically positive. The criminal process is so slow, it hadn't been completed, but at least the disclosure that these people were under investigation caused a very large number of them to lose the election. There is a concern that announcing uh, corruption investigations against certain politicians very close to an election can unfairly uh, distort or skew the results of an election, especially if it turns out that there's not much to the, the allegations. Uh, which is why in the United States the Department of Justice actually has rules about not making announcements with respect to investigations of politicians within a certain window, a certain number of days leading up to an election. And just as an illustration of, of why these rules might exist, or at least these norms might exist, in the most recent US presidential election, as some of you might know, the then director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation announced 10 days before the election that it was reopening an investigation into possible uh, misuse of a private email server by Hillary Clinton. Which, and there turned out to be nothing there whatsoever. Right? There were never any criminal charges filed. The best statistical analyses I've seen of the election by competent political scientists indicates that that announcement might have tipped the election. It wasn't the only thing going on in the election. It was already going to be very close. But the fact that you had a senior law enforcement official announcing we're looking into potential wrongdoing by this person running for office 10 days before the election had an impact. And so maybe, again, to connect this conversation to the one we had yesterday and what things that you all think about, especially those of you who are prosecutors or judges, the announcements that you make about these ongoing procedures can have significant electoral impacts, and maybe that can be a good thing. I can entirely see someone saying, look, it's going to take years before we get a result here, but the public needs to know what's going on. This information has to get out there. But there is a real concern, there's a real downside to doing that. Uh, and those of you who make those decisions, I think, are, have, have a great ethical responsibility to think about the disclosures that you make and how they could impact an election, especially when the process hasn't concluded. Other, oh uh, yes, please. Uh, we have been discussing uh, for a while now all these incentives, corruption, also mainly on, on the first couple of days talking about corporate bribery and, and and so on, and and it seems to me when whenever we're talking about electoral um, corruption, we only stick to uh, the election side, the election incentive to it. So uh, let's expose and hope that uh, the political party or the politician itself uh, going to be damaged by the corruption uh, scheme. And and I ask myself if we have. Uh, maturity on, on the democracy uh, to think about liabilities on the political party itself. As uh, uh, the lady said uh, a couple of minutes ago, um, it seems to me clear, it's, it is clear now that the Lava Jato case was strictly connected to the, the, the procedural of the, the, the election. So they own money to finance political parties so they can run um, over again. So, and by now, none of the political parties were um, somehow liable or responsible for uh, such corruption. 
So I, I, I'd like to bring uh, this topic here. Can we go further than only voting uh, to damage political parties that don't follow ethical um, means, you know? So maybe we're talking about compliance programs in, in corporate, uh, in companies. Can we talk about compliance programs in the same system, in the same carrot and stick to political parties uh, too? Maybe talking about leniency agreements, maybe talking about incentivizing uh, plea bargains by uh, politicians. Can we ask ourselves why none of the politicians are trying to do uh, uh, a plea bargain right now? There is a, there is a reason for it. Uh, why none of the, the, the political parties are trying to do a legacy agreement, there is a reason for it. Because they know they won't be liable, you know, and they keep going, keep uh, receiving money, and, and you know, it, it makes sense by now to keep doing, to being corrupt. I don't know, that's an int intriguing suggestion. What do other people think about that? I have an article uh, about <laughs> it, so. <laughs> Some publishing right now. <laughs> Ask him. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can share my thoughts more clearly on it. Terrific. Um, it's a quieter group today. Is it because the topic is too general, or because everyone is too tired? No. Oh wait, is that you? You're all right. Great. Um, it's, a, it's a question. It's not only a comment. Here in Brazil, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court is, is still discussing the definition of cor uh, public corruption, even though our legal rules seem seem to be, at least for me, very clear about it. The Supreme Court, uh, we have a, we have precedents and we have a jurisprudence that is not completely stable yet. So uh, the car wash revealed a very common practice that is. Um, rich um, executives or rich people, they give money or present or gifts or things like that to politicians. And just because they don't expect nothing immediately from them, but they do it, sometimes uh, they do it because they know that that politician is powerful and at some point in the future, they can benefit from that gift, from that loan. <laughs> Uh, so the Supreme Court, this, uh, this is still open in the Supreme Court if this is public corruption or not. And I know that in the U.S., the Supreme Court there, uh, recently, I think that 2016, judged a case at McDonald. Mac yeah. And after that, I read some articles, uh, American articles, and people were very critical of the president because they say, no, now cor public corruption in the US is legal and it's, it's authorized uh, the, the, the thing called uh, pay to play. So you pay and you have a, a privileged uh, access to the politician. So I would like uh, your opinion on the president and also uh, how this how uh, a more strict definition of corruption can uh, affect the relationship between money and politics. Yeah, it's, it's an it's a interesting question. It's one I f I'm, I'm worried that to give you a full answer would involve getting into the details of recent US law that I'm not sure would be of general interest, so I'll try to give maybe a short answer here, and I'd be happy to follow up with you or anyone else if you want to get into the, the details of, of that particular decision. But, um, so in the US, we don't have the crime with which someone like Governor McDonald's charge is not the crime of public corruption. So I don't know exactly how the statutes work here, but there are a number of specific crimes that we sometimes refer to as corruption offenses. But actually, if I'm in my mode as a lawyer, as opposed to just a commentator, corruption is not the crime. So there's a crime, there's a crime of bribery. There's also a crime called uh, the giving or receiving of illegal gratuities. 
which is like bribery, except you don't need to show that the uh, gift or thing of value that was promised or given uh, was done in order to influence the official decision. You only need to show that it was because of the official decision. And then there are a number of ethical rules separate from the federal criminal law that would prohibit, for example, the giving a receipt of gifts of a certain amount. So um, that's why the, I don't, again, I don't know how the conversation looks in Brazil. In the United States, it doesn't take the form of uh, what is public corruption? That's a debate that academics have. But in the, in the courts, it's what are the elements of these particular crimes? Uh, I think the claim that the McDonald case legalized public corruption is greatly exaggerated. I think the decision was wrong. I wrote extensively on my blog about why I thought it was wrong. But I also think the claim that it legalized public corruption is wrong for reasons that do really have to do with the details of what the case did and did not hold. Um, but we can get into that later. I think your, your broader question has to do with the relationship between, um, maybe let me, let me use this as a sort of entry point. One of the things that, that troubled so many people about that decision and about a number of the US Supreme Court's other decisions in this area is that the sense that in order to be sufficiently corrupt to justify limiting what in the US the courts consider a constitutional right to spend money spreading political messages, uh, the, the, the corruption has to be something like a, a quid pro quo, a very specific official act you're giving money uh, in order to get. The courts have said, the US Supreme Court has indicated that if you're making campaign donations, for example, to, for so-called ingratiation and access, well, that doesn't count as the kind of thing that would justify a limitation on what our courts consider the constitutional right to spend money on political advocacy, including to donate to campaigns. By the way, I want to make sure we differentiate political spending from gifts directly to the politician. McDonald involved gifts given directly to that person, which may be in a little bit of a different category. But again, I actually think this is one of the very interesting and important gray areas in the money, whole issue of money in politics and corruption. So uh, most people would agree that if you're running for office and I give you a million dollars for your campaign and this is expressly conditioned on the promise that if elected, you will vote to cut my taxes uh, or, to, or to send business to hire my company, use your influence to hire my company, that that would be illegal and that the law can and should prohibit that. On the other hand, if I just like you because I think that you're likely to vote to cut my taxes or that I think you're the kind of person who's likely to favor my company in bids, and I spend a lot of money buying advertising legally, saying, vote for you, you're great. Uh, at least in the United States, I think the thinking would be, well, that, that's okay. Uh, that's the democratic process. People should be able to advocate the, for the election of politicians that they like. The, the difficulty is that uh, there's this kind of gray area uh, in between where there's this sense exactly as you say, I'm, I'm donating to your campaign, I'm not asking for a particular favor now, but we develop this relationship and you're more likely to be uh, sympathetic to my interests and I might hint to you things. That, and how do you regulate that? I think this is one of the real challenges of regulating corruption in an electoral democracy. How do you regulate those relationships so they don't tip over into the world of corruption while also creating appropriate channels and avenues for people to try to influence politicians because they should and for people they should they should be able to try and for people to be able to advocate for uh, candidates that they like so I can't give you a better answer than that uh, but we're as we're maybe reaching the end of our time that might not be a bad point on which to conclude because I do think if uh, this country is, oh, you, have, you want to jump in here. Never mind, I, had, I was just in the process of formulating some concluding thoughts, but I'll hold off on that because you've been um, waiting to get it, so please. Foi um grande prazer passar essa semana com você. É, e minha pergunta é que 
como procuradora da República, que trabalha 10 anos na área de corrupção. É, existe hoje um, um, um... Essa palestra foi muito pertinente no momento que nós estamos vivenciando. E nós que atuamos nessa área, existe um... um, um, uma, um que somos o que, que gostamos que fazemos, nos sentimos vocacionados para isso, existe, pelo menos da minha parte, que eu posso falar por todos, existe um sentimento que você retratou aqui muito bem, de até que ponto a nossa atuação, que nós buscamos fazer da melhor forma possível, fa possa fazer com que nós não, é, não geremos na sociedade um sentimento de não pertencimento, de não, de não importância do regime democrático. Até porque nós vivemos num país, infelizmente ainda, que temos um baixíssimo índice de, de, alfabet, de alfabetização, uma educação ainda muito incipiente. Então, isso é uma coisa que nos preocupa muito. Eu falo isso porque até na minha família já ouvi pessoas dizendo que como a corrupção está tão alastrada, está tão disseminada, que é melhor que os militares assumam o país porque nós não podemos mais, é, o regime democrático, ele se frustrou, ele falhou. Então, é isso que hoje é o meu maior, minha, acho que o maior desafio hoje que militamos nessa área e que acreditamos que sim, devemos continuar nessa luta do no nosso combate à corrupção, quais os cuidados que nós devemos, devemos ter para que essa nossa luta não, não é, implique numa... É, numa, um, um problema que nós também não queremos de forma alguma que o nosso país possa viver esse ano. Obrigada. I think perhaps that's an even better note to conclude on than anything I was going to come up with. I think your comment really underscores exactly why it's so important to think about the relationship between the system of liberal democracy under the rule of law and corruption, and the fight against corruption, and more broadly, the promotion of good governance. I think some people really care about democratic, liberal institutions for their own sake. I think I, I, I would probably fall into that category. But for many people, uh, they value these institutions only to the extent that they feel like they are delivering a better life, that the government is running well, that it's serving their interests. And if The hope is that the institutions of liberal democracy will uh, deliver to the people good government, accountable government, government that serves their interests. The fear is, it, is if people start to perceive the institutions of liberal democracy as failing in doing those things, they may lose confidence in the institutions of liberal democracy and begin to look for other alternatives either within the, the democratic system in the form of populist demagogues who, who don't have much uh, interest in preserving systems of checks and balances, or in an even more extreme case, a uh, return to autocracy or military control, which is exactly why I think, I, I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that on Brazil's current anti-corruption agenda are not only reforms to the legal system, to codes of criminal procedure, uh, and so forth, but also, I gather, there are serious discussions about the political system and political reform. I, I don't know how much uh, realistic prospect there is for significant political reform in the short to medium term, but I'm very glad to hear that people are putting these issues on the table and thinking about precisely these sorts of questions about how do you design a system that can work, where people can raise the funds they need to run modern campaigns, uh, where people are allowed to attempt to engage with parties and politicians to influence them in positive ways, uh, but that don't end up falling into these systems of institutionalized corruption that can be so destructive. Uh, so Let's end our conversation there. Again, I'm three minutes over time, but that's not too much. Uh, and I will, since this is the last of my four presentations, I will take the opportunity to thank all of you for participating in these conversations, for welcoming me so warmly to your country. I've certainly learned uh, an extraordinary amount just from being here, and I hope this is the, not the last time I will be able to engage with all of you uh, collectively or individually. Thank you very much. I look forward to keeping in touch. Take care.